Do we have any questions? Or we go with JP. JP, are you connected? Yes, okay. Sorry, I was yeah. just finding the right window. Okay, well, a very nice presentation, Paul. Uh, good to see you. So, okay, everyone. So let me just uh, get this uh, started here. So um, good to be with you all today again. And um, we'll be discussing a little bit of the anatomy of the jugular foramen today. Uh, I'll be focusing on the specific nuances of the uh, in the nasal anatomy for this area. And uh, I'll try to be short. Uh, I'll try to be straight to the point uh, as, as we have. I, mean, I really want to see the cases that Antonio will present today. So uh, first of all, I'm, I'm João Paulo Meida, uh, an open endoscopic skull base surgeon, also do brain tumor surgery and, and microsurgery. And uh, today I'm going to be sharing uh, some of the anatomy of this region. And I want to thank uh, here uh, Maria Guevara, Bianca Gomez, and Dan Oberman, and three of my fellows that have uh, been showing some of the dissections that they did to illustrate this. So today, we're going to purely focus on, on the anatomy uh, for this area. Uh, importantly, so as uh, Paolo already mentioned, um, there are different uh, ways to approach the jugular foramen, uh, and that's basically uh, in relationship with through what door or what side of the jugular foramen you will be approaching this region. And of course, uh, that is to be decided based on the corridor that the pathology creates. And uh, of course, in, in the relationship that neurovascular structures will have with the related pathology. So for endoscopic and nasal uh, approaches, in my point of view, the, the key indication for such corridors is really for um, bone soft tumors, such as chordomas and chondrosarcomas that often will be originating in a different location, such as the clivus itself in the midline or in, in the petroclival region and be extending into the jugular foramen and therefore create a corridor. In my point of view, that is um, you know, a much better approach for those cases rather than for, for example, meningiomas or schwannomas of this region, which in my opinion are better fit for uh, open transcranial approaches uh, following one of the examples that Paul already mentioned. So uh, the jugular foramen, uh, here first I wanna thank the, the fellows that have been working with us uh, you know, throughout uh, the, this last year, uh, and especially those three guys. So this is Dan Alberman, uh, this is Maria Guevara, and this is Bianca. Maria, uh, Maria is from Argentina and then, and Bianca from Brazil, they uh, you know they just completing their their fellowship here with us, and and uh, they helped me with this presentation. So thank you very much. So this is a slide that I just got from the internet, actually showing the location as seen per the base of the skull of the of the jugular foramen. So as you see here, it's demonstrated in this red area, which englobes the carotid canal and the jugular foramen. And this relationship always must be kept into consideration that the jugular foramen is located posterior and lateral to the carotid canal, which therefore is anterior medial to the jugular foramen. Uh, at the same time, the styloid stilo process blocks the lateral access to the jugular foramen. Immediately, we have this relationship with the occipital condyle and the lower clivus. Uh, of course, uh, Paulo already described the lateral approaches, the posterior lateral approaches, and the anterior lateral approaches. And uh, today, my, my goal will be to be describing to you and discussing with you the anterior approaches through the endoscopic and nasal corridor. When we navigate through this area, I, I want to focus your attention to this key point here. I hope you guys can see my arrow, where we have the pterygoid process. Because you see, if we create a line that uh, will be going uh, in, this, in this direction, I just want to see if I can annotate here. I, I don't think so. But uh, if uh, we were to create a line where we would have this uh, following my arrow here, you would see that in the midline, which is usually the corridor that we use for endoscopic and nasal approaches, we'll have the lower clivus and its relationship with the uh, foramen magnum and laterally with the occipital condyles, but that takes us nowhere close to the jugular foramen. So we need to use an approach that will take us to the lateral aspect in the coronal plane. And uh, this corridor here often will be given to us by either use of angle endoscopes behind the petrous segment of the carotid in a, here in this area where we have the foramen lacero and therefore on top of it, the petrous segment of the carotid, or really through trans, trans uh, pterygoid approaches, so through the pterygoid processes, that will allow us then to mobilize foramen lacero and oftentimes the station tube to have access to the peripharyngeal ICA and 
posterior to it, the jugular foramen. Once again, key point in my opinion is that uh, this approach is usually done for soft bone tumors that already infiltrated those lateral spaces. And it's key to understand the relationship with the cranial nerves when deciding how to select and which approach to select. So we have this whole overview here of the skull base, and you see here uh, lamina papyricia, transcribed uh, form plate, uh, fovit moidalis, splint on tuberculum, cella, and the carotids. And this is just to give a view that this is all the sagittal plane, but this takes us nowhere close to the jugular foramen. The jugular foramen is really going to be a structure related with the lower clivus, as seen here. This is the lower clivus in the crunching, but not in the midline, located laterally. And therefore, related then with the parapharyngeal ICA that is going to be located just more laterally here, and posterior, inferior, and lateral to the petrous segment of the carotid. So in this, uh, to achieve that area, to achieve this approach, to mobilize the segments located in this lateral aspect will be key. That means the pterygoid plates and oftentimes the station tube as well. So you see here, this is a large phenoidotomy that has been completed. And uh, the key point uh, that we need to identify here is this uh, paraclive YCA prominence and the clival recess. Of course, the cell of prominence is right in the middle. But once again, this is just a starting point for the work that we'll be doing. Uh, after this sphenoid corridor is completed, we need to identify the anatomy of the pterygoid corridor, or the coronal plane. The trans corridor will be the workhorse for access to the coronal plane. And the first aspect, the first point is to identify the posterior wall, the maxillary sinus, that is composed by uh, this, this bone window. Uh, we, we will have to identify this process that is called the orbital process of the palatine bone. And behind it, we have the sphenoid process of the palatine bone. And between those two, we have the sphenopalatine canal. This is important because this allows us then to remove that piece of bone, identify the uh, periosteal layer that covers the posterior wall, the maxillary sinus, and then to identify the uh, vessel, which is the first layer, the vascular layer, the sphenopalatine artery that will supply uh, all the lateral wall, the nasal cavity, and the septum of the mucosa of the flap as well. So you see here the first layer, which is this vascular layer, the ranges of the IM, the IMAX, and then the sphenopalatine, the semipalatine, infraorbital. And then after you mobilize that first layer, uh, which is what we do with the classic transterogoid approach, you can see a neural layer. And then that is what is going to give you the access to the video nerve, uh, palatine nerves, and infraorbital nerve. Uh, to... If we were working on the cavernous sinus and macroscave, we can preserve the video nerve and work just above that area in the supravideon corridor. Sometimes we can just work below the video nerve, remove this piece of bone that is medial pterygoid process and have access to this lateral corridor. However, uh, this space is limited by the palatine nerves and the video. And oftentimes tumors in this area, especially so chordomas and chondrosarcomas, will be occupying both superior and medial spaces and in fact, sometimes involving this nerve. So uh, video nerve transaction often is key and will maximize our uh, visualization of the lateral play, uh, recess of the sphenoid sinus between the video nerve and V2 and provide us with this exposure of the pterygoid body and the pterygoid pro medial process and the lateral pterygoid process that would then give us access to the base of the middle fossa and V2, cavernous sinus and a starting point to the jugular foramen corridor. You, what you see here is that that median nerve uh, was transected and you can follow that video nerve to get to the petrous segment of the carotid. Here you only see the uh, clival segment or the vertical segment of the cavernous ICA. And you, here we will have this genome that will show us and we'll see that in a moment, the foramen lacerum. In another dissection here, we can already identify that the base of the sphenoid has been drilled, drilled out flush with the mid clivus here. And you can see now the base of what we're gonna call foramen lacerum, which as you will see shortly, it's nothing but a combination uh, of a space that is filled by fibrous uh, cartilaginous tissue that comes from the top of the station to median canal and pterygosphenoidal fissure. As we mentioned, after we identify the key points in the mid clivus and 
uh, last Saturday segment, we need to look at the lower clivus. And the first structure that we'll be identifying is nothing but the posterior part of the nasal cavity in its lower aspect. And here we have the vomer, and you can identify the eustachian tube, torus tuberium, uh, falseta of Rosa Miller, uh, and we have here in the midline the mucosa of the nasal pharynx. As those are removed, you can see once again station tube, torus tuberium, uh, Rosa Miller falsa, and you see here now the mucosa has been removed, and you can identify the fascia that will cover the two muscles that will be present here. Uh, in front of the bone of the cranial cervical junction, including rectus capitis anterior and longissimus capitis. Once those muscles are mobilized, we will be able to identify the cranial cervical junction. And you see here the lower clivus itself, C1, and behind that we would see C2. This is the anterior arch of C1. And then, of course, this is the C0 C1 junction or occipital uh, condyle C1 junction here on both sides. Uh, just on top of this, you can see here, I hope you can uh, observe a small groove that we call supracondylar groove, and that is a line where we can drill to identify the, the hypoglossal canal, and on top of that, we will be identifying, you can see here, the hypoglossal canal, and on top of the hypoglossal canal, we'll have the jugular tubercle area, and below the jugular, uh, the hypoglossal canal, it's part of the actual uh, occipital condyle. So when we're talking about midline approaches and we're looking just at this, when we remove this piece of bone to access more laterally, that's what we call far medial approach in, in the scopic world. In this case, though, this is just a starting point for more lateral approaches that we need to, to, uh, to discuss. So as we had been demonstrated with a zero degree endoscope in the lower clivus, uh, if we open that uh, canal, we're going to see the hypoglossal nerve and uh, the, the artery running in the hypoglossal canal, following the hypoglossal nerve. But uh, our key point is going to be just above the hypoglossal nerve in the region that will have the jugular tubercle and behind and lateral to the jugular tubercle, the, hypoglo the uh, actual jugular foramen. So you see here that as we try to get access to the lateral corridor, we're blocked and oftentimes we're blocked inferior laterally by this structure, which is the station tube. The station tube will be adherent uh, just on the top part to this tuber, located just lateral to V3. This is V3. This is the bone tuber that I'm talking about here. And you can disconnect that from its attachment to the base of the laceron foramen. That's a translaceron approach. Uh, and just mobilizing that with this translaceron approach, we can create space to follow that uh, tumor in the, into the jugular foramen, or we can actually mobilize the station tube, mobilize the carotid laterally, and get access to this region of the petrous apex in inferior, posterior, and laterally into the jugular foramen. If we actually go ahead and uh, sacrifice and disconnect the station tube from this connection here, you beautifully see this. Uh, you can see the tuber, you can see V3, V2. This is the mandibular uh, strut. Uh, and if we remove this tuber between V3 and uh, Petrus ICA, if, by the way, if we remove this bone, we would see the uh, pharyngeal ICA just behind the eustachian tube. Uh, we can remove the eustachian tube. We can see the uh, elevator uh, palatine muscle. And then we can see uh, the base of the jugular uh, tubercle. We can see the uh, carotid in the parapharyngeal space. And if we mobilize this fibrous tissue here, just lateral, medial to the carotid, and dissect it uh, posteriorly, we will see with a 30 degree endoscope, the jugular vein, which is seen down here, and the lower cranial nerves descending, and we can follow the uh, hypoglossal nerve as well. So you can see here in this uh, dissection, the descent of the 19 and 11 nerves, the 12 nerve that Paulo demonstrated joints with the lower cranial nerves in the cervical region before going to its final destination. And then when we open the dura, uh, we will see this relationship between the lower clivus, uh, the extradural space of the jugular tubercle, occipital uh, condyle, and hypoglossal canal, which in fact are all related, especially when we're dealing with uh, uh, chordomas in the lower uh, clivus and cranial cervical junction. So you see the communication of the uh, 12 hypoglossal canal, extradural uh, pathway of the hypoglossal nerve. And uh, up here, if we drill the region of the jugular tubercle, we will see the trajectory of the lower cranial nerves through jugular foramen and into the cervical region. 
you can see here in more detail after we complete what we are now calling uh, here at least a, a real far lateral endoscopic approach in differentiation of the far medial endoscopic approach. We can get this access that is clearly here. Uh, you can see the difference if you remove the tubercle and if you don't remove, if you remove the tubercle and if you don't, what you can get. Of course, this is more so if the tomb already created that space, I would not advocate uh, necessarily for all this extensive removal for meningiomas, despite the fact that some tubercle, uh, jugular tubercle meningiomas may be good candidates for endoscopic in the nasal approach. Uh, and then here in more detail, just to demonstrate this connection between lower cranial nerves, hypoglossal uh, nerve and, and hypoglossal canal uh, joining together with uh, the trajectory between the carotid and the internal jugular vein in the neck. Here is just a perspective uh, from a, you know, a bilateral view in a straight angle, demonstrating this relationship of the carotid uh, in the lacerum segment, pictures, and then parapharyngeal ICA with the region of the jugular foramen and cranial cervical junction uh, to complete this, this brief presentation. So once again, uh, just uh, you know, a, a pass through the endoscopic anatomical region. And I'd like to thank the fellows that have been working with us. And I'd like to thank, of course, uh, Sebastian, Wayne, Paolo, uh, and, and all the 